In real life, when we are trying to accomplish a task, we don't always have a specific target or a single value that we are trying to achieve. Uh, sometimes it will be a maximum value that we're trying to get or a minimum value or maybe a range of possibilities. Um, in situations like this, equations don't really make sense to use, and so instead we use inequalities. We're going to start our discussion of inequalities by talking about inequalities that have only one variable in them. Let's start by talking a little bit about the difference between equations and inequalities. Uh, equations and inequalities look and behave very similarly in many ways, but they actually denote very different concepts and sets. For instance, we can look at the equation x equals 5 and compare it to the inequality x is greater than or equal to 5. These statements look very similar, but they actually represent very different things. Thinking about the equation x equals 5, you're talking about a single value of x, and it's 5, and that's the only possibility. Whereas with the inequality, x is greater than or equal to 5. Well, 5 is a part of that. That's what the equal to is about. But we're also talking here about everything that is greater than 5. So 6, 7, 8, and on and on and on. In fact, this statement represents an infinite possible number of values for x. Similarly, we can look at a statement like 2x plus 1 equals 13 and compare it to an inequality 2x plus 1 is less than or equal to 13. We know how to solve this equation. We can solve it and we would find that x equals 6 is the solution in this case. But what about the inequality? What does it mean to solve an inequality like this and what does the solution look like? Just like with an equation, a solution to an inequality is supposed to be a value that will produce a true statement if you plug it into the inequality. The difference is that where an equation might have one or maybe a handful of solutions, an inequality will often have many solutions, even an infinite number of solutions. And we usually want to try and find all of them if we can. Let's test a few values in our inequality here and see if we can get a handle on what the solutions to it are. Notice that the symbol here says less than or equal to. And so that means that 2x plus 1 equals 13 is a part of the set that we're going to be talking about. Well, we already know that x equals 6 is a solution to that equation. And so it would make sense that x equals 6 should also be a solution to our inequality. So let's test that by plugging it in. 2 times 6 plus 1 less than or equal to 13. Well, 2 times 6 is 12. 12 plus 1 less than or equal to 13. 13 less than or equal to 13. That's true. So that means 6 is a solution to our inequality. Let's try another one and see if it still works. Say a number near 6. Let's try 7. 2 times 7 plus 1, less than or equal to 13. Multiplying out, 2 times 7 is 14, plus 1, less than or equal to 13. 14 plus 1 is 15, less than or equal to 13. Now this statement is not true, so that means that 7 is not a solution to our inequality. Let's try one more, another number near 6, let's say 5. If we plug 5 in, 2 times 5 plus 1 less than or equal to 13. Well, 2 times 5 is 10 plus 1 less than or equal to 13. That gives us 11 less than or equal to 13. And that is true, so that means that 5 is a solution to our inequality. As we'll see in a second, you can use algebra to come up with a description of all the possible solutions to our inequality. In this case, if you did that, you would end up with the statement x is less than or equal to 6. So in fact, any number that is 6 or less will be a solution to this inequality. Let's go through a couple examples to see how the algebra works when you're trying to solve inequalities. The good news with inequalities is that in many ways they work similarly to working with equations. You have the same rules about doing the same thing to both sides, and the goal is the same, to try and get the x by itself. There is one extra quirk that inequalities have uh, over equations, but we'll see that momentarily. 
Let's look at our first example, negative 3x plus 8 less than or equal to 20. The goal, just as if it was an equation, is to get the x by itself. And the tools that we have are the same. We can subtract from both sides. We can multiply and divide from both sides. And so in this case, it would probably make the most sense to start by moving the 8 over to the other side by subtracting. So we subtract 8 from both sides. And that leaves us with negative 3x less than or equal to 20 minus 8 is 12. Now if we want to get the x by itself, we need to then move the negative 3 over somehow. Since it's being multiplied by the x, we can divide both sides by negative 3 to make that happen. And this is where the quirk of inequalities comes in. On the sides, everything behaves as we would expect. Negative 3's cancel off on the left-hand side, and we are just left with x. And on the right-hand side, 12 divided by negative 3 is negative 4. The one quirk with inequalities is that when you multiply or divide by a negative number, the inequality sign has to change direction in order to remain equivalent to the original statement. And so in this case, our less than or equal to sign flips around and becomes greater than or equal to. So what we can conclude is that any value that is negative 4 or larger, so negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, etc., will be a solution to our original inequality up here. We can get a pictorial representation of that solution by using a number line. Here's a number line. Here's 0. Here's negative 4. The values that we have determined are solutions are all the values that are negative 4 or larger. So we can indicate that negative 4 is a solution with a closed dot, and then shade all the values that are bigger to indicate our solution. Now let's look at the second example. The first thing you should notice is that this looks different than the first one. This one has three parts to it, as opposed to the other one, which only had two parts. This is what's known as a compound inequality, or a three-part inequality. The goal here is to get the x by itself in the middle, and what we will end up with is a range of possible values for x. We can work with compound inequalities the same way we work with other inequalities. We can do whatever we want as long as we do it to all three pieces of the inequality. So our first step in this case we want to get rid of the 14 here, and we can do that by subtracting 14 from all three parts. And what that leaves us with is negative 4 less than 4x less than 12. Next, we would like to remove the 4 from the middle here, because our goal is to get the x by itself. And we can do that by dividing. Divide by 4 to all three parts. And so what we conclude is negative 1 on the left less than x less than 3 on the right. So what this tells us is that values that are between negative 1 and positive 3 should be solutions to our original equation up here. And again, we can get a pictorial representation of that by using a number line. Here's our number line. negative 1, positive 3. Our solution is supposed to be values that are strictly in between negative 1 and positive 3. So when we represent it, instead of putting solid dots on negative 1 and positive 3, we can put open circles to indicate that those are the boundary of the solution but not actually included in the solution itself. The solution itself is everything in between those two things, and so we shade to represent those values. When solving inequalities, we'll often end up with statements like this, x greater than or equal to negative 4, or negative 1 less than x less than 3, or maybe 10 less than or equal to x less than 15. Because we talk about sets like this so often, mathematicians have developed a special notation called interval notation to talk about things that look like these. And the way it works is 
an interval notation always specifies a smallest value and a largest value, and it specifies whether the endpoints are included or not. Let's start with our middle example here, negative 1 less than x less than 3. If we wanted to put this into interval notation, the smallest possibility is negative 1, and that goes on the left, then a comma, and the largest possibility is positive 3, that goes on the right. On each side, we now put a symbol to indicate whether the value there is actually included as part of the solution or is just the boundary. In this case, the negative 1 and the 3 are both not actually part of the solution. These are both strict inequalities. And so we don't want to include them as part of the answer. The way that we express that is using a parentheses. A parentheses means the value is just the boundary of the solution but not actually part of the solution itself and that goes on both sides. Now let's look at our right-hand example here, 10 less than or equal to x less than 15. We'll start in the same way by identifying the smallest and largest possible values. In this case, the smallest possible value for x is 10, and then a comma, and the largest possible value for x is 15. Once again, we have to indicate whether each of these values is a part of the solution itself or just the boundary. Looking at 10, you notice that 10 equals x is a valid possibility here, and so we want to indicate that 10 is actually a part of the solution, and we do that by putting a square bracket. On the other side, the 15, this is once again a strict inequality. x equals 15 is not actually included here, and so we indicate that with a parentheses. Now let's go back and look at our left-hand example here, x greater than or equal to negative 4. Well, we know we're going to be making an interval, so we need a comma. We have to determine, is negative 4 the smallest possible value or the largest possible value? Well, looking at the inequality, it's a greater than or equal to. So values that are included are bigger than negative 4. In other words, negative 4 is as small as x is allowed to get, so it's the smallest possible value. But now, what goes in on the right-hand side? We don't have anything on the other end. In cases where there is no upper bound or lower bound, we use the infinity symbol to represent that. Now to finish this off, we need to indicate whether each value is included as part of the solution or not. Negative 4, in this case, is a part of the solution, and so we use a square bracket on it. Infinity, on the other hand, is a value that can never actually be achieved, and so it can't be part of the solution to our inequality. Therefore, we use a parentheses on infinity.